Hello. Well, did you know that the specifications for CD and therefore the digital audio formats we still use today was based on the capabilities of this equipment and a couple of its predecessors when connected to a Umatic professional video recorder? So this is a PCM1630. There were a couple of earlier models, but they were largely the same. And this connected with the Umatic video recorder and there were some special machines for the job allowed recording studios to make a tape that they could then send to the CD uh, pressing plant and also exchange between uh, recording studios. So it was an extremely influential format that we're still feeling ripples of its effect uh, all these many decades later. This machine is around about 1984 uh, vintage. Now there is a bit of a limitation using these today if we want to extract the digital audio from those tapes. It has analog outputs and you can record that, that's fine. But much better if we could take a digital out from this. And it has a digital output port, but it's an obscure, old, non-standard by today's standard format. And there's no easy way to convert that to a modern digital audio data stream that we could record on a modern digital audio recorder. Let me show you the problem. Looking at the digital outputs, we would actually use these three terminals, channel one, channel two, and output for word sync, those three are required for taking digital audio out from this in a format called SDIF or SDIF2, for, uh, which was a Sony special format. There is no output which produces what we could record today, uh, which would be SPDIF or TOSLINK, they're the same signal in a different way, or very closely related uh, format called AES EBU, which is basically a balanced version of the same thing. So these outputs won't connect to modern equipment. The other outputs here, or the other connections here, go to the video recorder. So you look here, composite digital, you might think, oh, that's a digital connection. It's not. It actually means composite video, and it's got uh, two channels because it records and records again. So it can record on uh, kind of two sweeps on the head to uh, reduce the chances of errors. But nothing here is compatible with modern equipment. So, you will have seen on a previous video of mine, I modified a DAT machine, uh, a particular special machine, Sony 2500A, 2500B uh, assembly. Uh, I modified it so that it could go from the uh, SDIF2 signal to uh, the more modern uh, SPDIF, which you could connect to modern recorders. But that's a clunky affair because it does rely on the DAT mechanism working and I'm having trouble with it. Sometimes it freaks out and comes up with a caution light and it just doesn't work. And when it's in that state, I can't use it to output the uh, digital audio stream. So I really needed a better solution. And I've been looking one for a long time, but equipment that converts from this old and obscure uh, SDIF, SDIF2 format to modern digital audio it was never made in very large quantities and is really hard to get. So I was very pleased when I managed to get hold of this. Let's have a look at it. So here we have this uh, PCM1630 machine and it's connected up to this DMR4000 Umatic player. Uh, if I press play on there, we can get audio from here and I could record it on a digital audio recorder such as this Tascam DR100 Mark II via the analog connections and the quality for that is fine but we want a pure digital route so how can we do that so this is a piece of equipment i bought it's uh, from a manufacturer called adt which was uh, audio digital technology there we go uh, it's called a digital audio format converter sdiff i'm not sure if they meant sdiff2 i think they did to aescbu which is this thing very similar to TOSLINK and SPDIF, or the other way around, but we won't need that. And we've connected up those three signals. So we have SDIF lock here, which means it's working, uh, and power core. So let's look around the back. So these were the uh, three input cables we were looking at. So the two channels and word clock. Then this is a balanced output which uh, is, if I take that to an unbalanced cable, it actually gives me SPDIF as far as this Tascam recorder is concerned, and power up the other end. 
There's a model number which is handwritten on and a very low serial number because they apparently only made about 400 of these things. And with this, if I take that balanced output and via some kind of adapter cable, uh, I'm going to this connector, which is correct for the digital input of this digital audio recorder. I then have to go through a rather painful menu on this thing, which is set the remote control input to be digital in. I know, I know whoever thought that menu out. So now I can play on here and record digitally on this thing. And I can prove it's digital because I'll unplug the analog connections. So that's a pure digital uh, copy of the tape contents. You do need to be careful though because a lot of these tapes are recorded with pre-emphasis and you have to take that off digitally uh, and uh, there's a curve you can apply, a red book curve, uh, which you can do with Audacity audio editing software. Well, if you're still with me on this, I'm sure you're as interested to have a look inside this thing as I am. And I've had a little conversation with one of the people who was involved in building this thing. He says there's a couple of FPGAs in here, and he also tells me that this D connector at the back was probably not wired up. Let's have a look inside. So taking a slightly closer look, LED indicators here. The SDIF data and SDIF unbalanced LED seems to have fallen in slightly. These are at the front. I did notice they were a bit dim, or that one was dim. So I'm going to see if I can bring those LEDs back to the front panel. Power switch at the right side. Apparently they made a half-sized version of this as well, where the power supply was uh, external. Uh, I'm also told that the power supply inside is simple, it's just a 7805 regulator. So it probably doesn't take a lot of um, uh, power. And there's our connectors. So I was using left, right, word clock inputs. My solution before that used that uh, 2500 A and B DAT machine didn't require the word clock input. But I think it's better to have it. I've been taking this output here and using that to... Uh, a cable which goes from AES to SPDIF. Interesting. One of the screws is missing and one of the screws is loose on this socket. I wonder if that's trying to tell me something. I'll have to have a look at that. And this is the, the 9 pin D connector that may not be connected. Uh, right, let's uh, take a look inside. I'm very worried about this missing screw. What is that going on about? It's worth also mentioning that uh, the unit can work the other way around. So you can go AES EBU input and output uh, the um, SDIF2 signal to record onto a, a PCM1630. But clearly that's not something I need to do now. Right, let's have a look. Well, that's very clean and neat, isn't it? For a low volume product, very smart. Revision 2 it says. AES to SDIF or the other way around. So there's the two FPGAs. I'm glad to see that it's not full of capacitors to fail. Uh, these are these LEDs which have uh, shifted on the front panel so I can fix them while we're here. better already. So uh, where is this 7805 regulator? I'm not seeing that at all. This appears to be just transformer, diodes, half-wave rectifier maybe? It's only two diodes. 78L05 regulator there, so the uh, consumption must be very low. So why is this loose? Why would somebody have undone the screws on that? Getting a little closer. Uh, I think I recognise those as phase lock loop ICs. Uh, so that's something to do with clock recovery. Um, they want at least one of those might be um, setting the centre frequency of one of these phase lock loops. So do not touch those. The D connector is wired up. So I think what this is about potentially is a way of 
sending the data, the output data, over a long cable distance. Uh, so I believe that was used for potentially uh, connecting a, a long cable, and so this is driver electronics for that. This little bit of circuitry, I think, is for the input and output um, buffers going over to here for this, the main circuit, which consists of, I think, these two FPGAs, and what else do we have here? Let's look those parts up. Right, so that is a uh, receiver and decoder for ASEBU and SPDIF. So I believe that's uh, an associated part for this one as a driver IC for the digital data. So the real guts to it really is in, in these two ICs. Looking a little closer, I see there's at least one part that's dated 1993. So it's a little bit later than I expected. You know, I'm starting to see something here. Looking at the socket that had the screws missing, look where it's soldered down onto the PCB. Can you see a little ring of broken solder around that pin? Right there. So I'm beginning to suspect that the reason somebody slackened off those screws, and it might be true here as well, is because they were having a bit of a, a connection problem. And they fiddled with the screws and found that uh, the problem went away as it altered the angles of the socket. So I'm going to resolder these connections here. Uh, I don't think I need to take the whole board out. I think I can do it from here. Just resolder on the top side these connections. Now this power supply really is just a uh, you know, transformer, rectifier and capacitors. There's not much to go wrong, but just to be on the safe side, I think I will check the condition of the two capacitors. Um, I'm sure they're fine, but let's uh, do that with an ESR meter. Having disconnected some of the uh, lines from the power supply to the electronics, maybe I can measure the capacitors. This one I think is supposed to be a thousand microfarad. Yes, it seems to have the 1000 and the 2200 in parallel, so that's giving us about the right reading. We're not seeing high ESR or any other problems. I can uh, reassemble that. It looks like this power supply is probably used for other products which have more complicated needs than this one, including a relay and probably other voltages. I've noticed another loose screw on this. Why so many loose screws? Okay, I've... Uh, raided one of the screws from the inside for this socket. Um, although I might replace that if I can find one of the right size. There we go. Good. I'll reassemble that and give it a final test. So now you can see it's making a pure digital recording. Uh, you see the digital marker on the display there. So that equipment now helps me to get the very best possible recordings from these early PCM digital audio tapes. It should be noted, of course, that uh, the biggest impediment to audio quality on these is dropouts on the tapes. And whether you get a digital or an analog uh, transfer is kind of a, a second order thing. But it's still worth trying to get right, and I'm really pleased with that new equipment. Please remember to like, share and especially subscribe and I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.